It's time for Supply Chain Now. Broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain. The people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton and Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Greg, good afternoon. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm pretty excited to have this conversation. We are. One of our favorite guests. One of our favorite guests. Seriously, this is one of my favorite people. So yes, we need to hear. Real life practitioner turned to changing the fortunes of corporations. Love it. Yes. Well, you know, what, what also what's exciting here, because we kind of we got the best of both worlds, not only do we have an outstanding guest, yeah. but we're relaunching a reinvigorated full access series, right, where we're focusing on really an empowering and uplifting stories of women in senior leadership roles, leading organizations, initiatives, doing big things. And there's so much uh, that we've gotten feedback wise from our audience about these types of conversations, right? Yeah, I mean, I, first, I love the spirit of this series. And I can't think of a better way to start it than one of the most powerful leaders I've met anyway, but certainly an already empowered female leader. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I I just think this is a fantastic start to the series. Agreed. Plus, Uh, it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun. (laughs) So we're going to be working really hard to increase your supply chain leadership IQ here today. Hey, quick programming note. If you enjoyed today's conversation, be sure to find us and subscribe so you don't miss these conversations wherever you get your podcast from. All right. So now that we've really teed things up, because we are excited about our guests here today, let's no formally wel- welcome our guest in. We're, gonna, we're uh, talking today with Cindy Lago, Vice President with Cap Gemini, of course, a global leader in consulting, uh, technology, digital transformation, and a whole lot more. Cindy, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? We're doing really good. Glad to fantastic. have you with us. <laughs> so I'm you know, excited to be here. We were talking pre-show, you know, the last time you were with, with both of us, uh, you know, it feels like it was about five years ago. It's probably about a year and some change ago at the bank of America tower in smack dab middle of Atlanta had a great conversation, fun, engaging conversation. And we're, we're really excited about having you back on here and putting our finger on the pulse, but with a, a more of an emphasis on, your background, your journey, and some of your key lessons learned through it all. Absolutely. So you're ready to dive in. Absolutely. Let's go. All right. Greg, where we start? It seems like the last time we were together with Cindy, she coined a phrase that I can never put my finger on. Do you remember that? Batch of one. The batch Batch of of one. one. That's right. We were talking about customization in retail to the consumer. Yes. Yeah. The one. Right. And by the way, I still hold the trademark there. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you do. You went, you went right out there and did that, right? <laughs> Not at all. All right. So let's, for anybody who doesn't know who you are, let's do get to know you first. Um, so tell us a little bit about where you grew up. Your family situation is really cool. Um, and, and, you know, give us some of your fond memories of childhood and how you keep them with you. I think there's an interesting story as well. Yeah, so um, so I grew up on <laughs> grew up on a farm, a dairy farm, right? So um, in Ohio, and still spend half of my year there um, with my my family close to them. When I started traveling all the time, I decided that you know I don't want to spend vacations visiting them, so let's spend our weekends when we're home <laughs> visiting them. Did never never imagined that it would be five days a week, <laughs> seven days a week, <laughs> right? <laughs> for months on end, but right. yeah. But it's, um, you know, thus, thus moving to Florida. Um, but, you know, so my, my childhood was, was definitely raised on dairy farm, um, you know, family farm for many generations. We're on the fifth generation now. My nephew will be taking over in a few years, so it's pretty exciting. Um, you know, my fondest memory is, is probably just that, you know, the work-life balance. You know, I'm, the, the good news for me is that growing up on a dairy farm, you know, you kind of work in life or they're mingled. And so my work-life balance has probably been the, been 
easy is for me not to define them as work-life balance, right? But just, you know, how do you find that balance period? So I think, you know, having that, having that work ethic and, and really, you know, kind of more of a hands-on approach of, of learning things and doing things and then, you know, and then teaching others and, and helping, you know, companies learn and, and grow and, and do different things differently. Um, I think I contribute a lot to how I grew up and, and how I, um, my family worked with me and how, you know, how we all work together on the farm to make things happen. So, so I, I have to ask you, did you have a particular task or role or area of responsibility? Uh, so did I? Yes, we had, I had a particular task or role. Um, I, you know, of course was assigned female duties because, you know, I grew up in a very, very, you know, male dominated world at the time. So that went over well with me, as you can imagine. So I decided <laughs> that, that, that when I was in fifth grade that I would learn to milk because I figured, you know, why not? So, right. you know, so I did get to do that for a while until I just, um, I was a little hyper and the cows got scared and I had to, my father asked me to stop. So really um, yes. Were you rushing them. I wasn't rushing them. I was just, I would be bored in between waiting for them to finish. And so I'd go out and do things and make noise and he'd be like, no, can't do that. I'm like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I'm bored. So no, it was all good. It was, um, you know, it was, he was, very, you know, I, I wanted to be, you know, whatever a boy could do, I could do. That was my, you know, so, so it was definitely led to, to, to inspiring me, um, to drive me hard to drive hard and to, you know, but also to, to, to really, you know, realize that you know, t taking pride in what you do and, and doing things, you know, well is important. And, you know, I think a lot of times and, and being sincere and, and very, um, honest about what, how you, you know, about life and, and some really great values that, that I think, you know, I, it, I wouldn't have given it up for the world. And to be out in the country and as a kid and be able to run around and do whatever you want, that was pretty cool. So. And, and you mentioned that whole work-life balance thing. I mean, it's really hard to draw a line there, but. It is, it is, it, it really is. And, and, you know, so I never, I've never looked at work-life balance as being, as defined, um, you know, sometimes that's been to my detriment. I think you have to, you know, there, there is definitely a, um, when you, when I think of, you know, when I talk to, uh, when I talk to a lot of the, the people that either work for me or uh, and act, actually other companies or colleges about, you know, about work, work-life balance always comes up. And especially as a female, I think work-life balance comes up even more. Um, and it, you know, one of the things I always tell them is there's no definition. You know, everybody has their own definition of work-life balance. You know, it's 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 what you what you feel that makes works for you and what how you balance it, right? So, you know, for me, it's being able to switch back and forth, and mm -hmm. it's being able to 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 be you know doing work, but then if I need to do something that's you know personally related, you know, I have to give myself that break and say, okay, go do that. Um, but you know. It's, it's everybody is different. You know, I used to, I would tell people that, you know, women that had families, you know, be like, well, you know, I have my kids and I have, I, you know, I'm like, you need to have your own work-life balance. I mean, but the big thing is you got to communicate that to people. You need to say, Hey, you know, nobody's going to get mad if you, if you need to, to go take care of something, as long as you communicate to them, you know, people just don't like being surprised. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm going to be off every day at this time because of this. And you find out on accident. So, yeah. you know, I think it's, you know, it's definitely in today's day and age, you got to draw your own, um, you know, got to draw your own lines, but you got to do it respectfully and you got to communicate it well. And I think, you know, as a leader, that's my job is to make sure that my team is, is defining their work-life balance in a way that works for them, but also making sure that, you know, they also are communicating to the rest of their team and setting expectations because I think, you know, people get upset when they have missed expectations. They don't get upset when they know, you know, what's going on. So. And that communication has gotten more challenging in this oh. current work from home environment where we all, for folks that have ever overread into an email or, you know, uh, a, a passive uh, communication, 
it's more challenging. You don't have that, that opportunity at the water coolers we talk about or to pop into a right. cubicle or an office or a group session and be able to have that face to face or not, not, not at least not as often as, you know, a year ago. No, agreed. And you have to like, kind of, you know, like you, you don't, you can't walk down the hall with your, you know, with one of your clients and start, you know, talking about like, how do you move things forward? It's, it's very, um, compartmentalized, right? Cause you're on the screen and you're either on the screen talking to them or you're on the phone and then it just ends. And it's not like this, you know, Oh, you know, let me just, you know, I, I love the new commercial where that guy's answering somebody's phone, phone, um, phone message by driving up to his house and, you know, popping yes. in and seeing them. <laughs> brilliant. You know, so, <laughs> isn't that brilliant, right? Like I, you know, so that's, it, it makes for some long days sometimes because I do want to spend time, you know, talking to my team and not just answering the email because it is, it's so, I think it's important to have those conversations. So for sure. Uh, that's really interesting because I think you having lived on a farm and I having worked some on a farm, you're never off work, mm -hmm. but you're also never off life. I mean, right right? The neighbor could come over while you're in the middle of your work and you could lean on fence posts for the rest of the day, just shooting the bull, right? Not literally shooting the bull. I don't think people <laughs> are not on farms. They probably don't know this. <laughs> just a figure of speech people. But uh, I mean, but that could happen, right? Or you could, yeah. I, I mean, you could have the situation where you got to duck and do something and then get back to, to where you were. So I hadn't yeah. really thought about it from that perspective, but that's a really valuable way to be able to to work especially in today's day and age right yeah so, and it's sort of like Murphy, murphy's law like every holiday i swear there'd be something that broke and you'd be like uh okay well we'll hold off until <laughs> yeah second, right. second, okay second. right after lunch right after dinner <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, so so it sounds like obviously that life experience was a great influence on you i, I mean mm -hmm. if you think about your early life probably pre-career who would you say or maybe it's multiple people, but w w what people or in instances or experiences would you say had a big influence on you and why? Well, I mean, I would definitely say growing up the way I did. I mean, I, I grew up, you know, and I think it had double and it had an influence both ways. You know, um, I learned, you know, how to, how to be a good business person, how to work hard for my father. But at the same time, I learned that, you know, I don't want to be a, a, a lady from the 50s and 60s and I want to have my own independence. And so um, not that he was from that gender. He, he definitely, you know, lives much more of a, a farm life and, and that. So, so I think, you know, I, I had to learn both things from them. Um, I, I learned, you know, from, I, I, but I was always encouraged to follow my own passion. I mean, never, you know, was expected to, to like just, hang out in the country for the rest of my life and, you know, not move on. And, and I think, you know, having, having that support system from your family and having, having that um, willingness to, to be able to, to go and succeed and, and that, that, that push to do it. You know, my, my, um, my parents said, you know, they're like, okay, you're going to college. Like there was just certain expectations. They never went to college. They were just like, you're going to college, you know, you're doing these things. And, you know, I was the oldest child. So, um, you know, there was a lot around, um, you know, from a perspective of this is what, you know, this is the direction you need to, what you need to do and a lot of guidance that was given to me. And I think that, you know, a lot of that um, structure um, really helped me grow. I would say that, you know, then, then when I started my career, I think I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and I went to, you know, went and majored in, in, fashion merchandising, which is probably the farthest thing from farming that you possibly could do. So, you know, which uh, may have been intentional <laughs> by your parents. <laughs> exactly. No, but, um, I really was interested in retail and, and from the very beginning, I've always been very passionate about that. And so, um, went into, to that and into the whole merchandising and buying side of it. And, and, you know, I think, um, having, you know, the business background of being working on, you know, growing up in a, in a self-employed background and then driving into, you know, learning how to, to manipulate the business world and, and some of the core lessons around, you know, just people and skills and, and how do you really focus on, on driving um, your career and your success was, was you know, part of me was a little naive 
and I would say that, you know, I had some big supporters in my career um, that really helped push me over that, that edge. Um, and why, why I say that is, you know, when you, when you focus on, you know, thinking that doing the right thing is going to always, you know, which is really important and you should always do the right thing, is going to get you to where you need to be. And, you know, you really have to also then learn how to lead. And I've been, I think the fortunate thing that I was, that I was very fortunate is that, you know, I, I worked for some individuals in my first career where they, you know, they gave me a lot of opportunity to grow. They put me in new positions because they, they saw my willingness to learn. And so I was in, you know, working in new areas and got into planning and inventory management and all the supply chain functions that, you know, was the, kind of the furthest thing, but they saw that, you know, I was always willing to take on more and I wanted to learn more and I wanted to grow. And so I appreciated that um, opportunity, but then, you know, going in and um, it, working, you know, for, for my first female boss and learning good and bad about how to, you know, deal with people. Um, and I don't mean that in, in the point of that work, the, the, I got a lot of support in my, in my career from both male and female, but I would say that um, learning how to be a, you know, a, a leader and um, balancing some of the things that happen when you're in kind of a male dominated world like supply chain tends to be, um, was very fortunate in, in my career to, you know, to get in um, support and mentorship from, from women executives. And, um, you know, I worked for a jewelry company and probably, you know, one of the first female executive vice presidents that I ever worked for. And she was, you know, very supportive and, you know, both from a business perspective, but also a personal perspective. So, you know, it really helped me grow. And I think that, you know, having that mentor, having um, that ability to, to talk to somebody around, you know, what you want to do and drive. And whether it's a female or a male, I think you, you have to have that. You have to have those, those people that can help you move your leadership skills forward. Um, and that's really, you know, been, I've been very fortunate in that. I've been very fortunate to have, you know, find and get, have, have mentors that have helped me grow in that direction. So I have to, I have to, I have to ask you a really quick question. And um, because you made me think of this in talking about your youth. So sometimes in the Midwest and sometimes in, especially in the farming community, I always think, I always wonder if everybody in the Midwest isn't somehow related to Mark Twain, because one, they're great storytellers. They are, Midwestern people are fantastic. Everything is fascinating to Midwestern people, it seems like so often. And, and the other is they tend to do these thing, this thing where they'll say something that is somewhat obscure and it's like a life test. How smart, how witty, how uh, introspective or how insightful is this person if I give them this little nugget, how do they respond to that? Do you remember that ever happening to you? Somebody kind of giving you half the information or half a sentence, a, you know, one of those words to the wise type of moments. And, and did, did any of those ever stick with you? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, it is funny that you say that we're they're great storytellers because I, I do think that, um, Maybe it's because we have nothing else to do. We just tell stories. I've I always know. thought that. But, I've always thought that, honestly. And everything's no. so fascinating because everything is so normal in the Midwest, right? You, yeah. you basically, you do your work, you do your school work, you spend time with family, you go to bed, right? And you get up and right. do it all the same way all over again in the next day. I think we, I think because it's like that, we, we focus on, we try to find adventures. Yeah. You know, I, I do, um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we we can be obscure sometimes. I think in how we, we talk because we you and we infer a lot. I you know I think that you when you grow up in the Midwest you you kind of you know there's a there's a certain work that that people have. There's a certain um, way that people work that you just kind of know. Yes. So. Yeah, I feel I felt like it was a constant test. <laughs> I mean, like people would give you half of it and really you could almost feel like they were trying to activate your brain to see like how you would respond to that. Um, yeah. and it's interesting because I hear a lot of that. I hear a lot of what you've taken away and taken into your career from, 
from those types of experiences. It sounds really familiar to me. So if you've watched, if you've watched or read anything recently has that has really kind of ignited your thought. It, so, yeah. So, you know, what's really funny. Um, so the, I, I, besides trying not to be soaked up into Netflix series because I just cannot, I, I just, I can't stand binging. It drives me crazy because I just I have to get to the end. Um, and so I, I just like try to avoid them after, after, um, money heist. I was like, I'm done. I'm, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. It's just too much. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that when you when you ask me this question, the, the thing that comes to my mind, which is really funny, is is my favorite book, which is The Alchemist by Pablo Coelho. Ed Colo, I'm going to say his name right. Um, and the reason that it's a very inspirational book. So if you haven't read it, you need to read it. Um, and I had my 11 year old, well, no, sorry, my 12 year old niece read it. And cause she said to me one day, what is your, what is your favorite book? And so I said, you know, this is my favorite book. And so she read it and she's like a really fast reader. Like she, you know, she's reading these books and I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm just like 500 pages long and she whips through them. Anyways, the, um, and and it was very interesting because I said to her, I said, so um, she I said, what are you, what are you, she didn't ever told me she read it. I gave it to her. I said, you know, you should read this. It's a really good book. I said, so, you know, what's your, and so we, we talk a lot about like what she's been read, what she's read and, you know, what's her favorite book. And she's like, I go, so what's your favorite book now? And she's like, The Alchemist. I'm like, you seriously read it? So then I had to go back and reread it because of course, you know, we had to talk about it, but um, you know, I, I I love to your point about how Midwesterners kind of throw things out there and make you think about it. That's exactly how he writes. And so he's a very inspirational writer um, and he's very thought provoking in his writing. So um, he's by far my favorite author. And as soon as he comes out with a new book, I read it every time. Really? I'm going to have to read it now. <laughs> the I'm Alchemist. Not a, I'm not a great reader, but. Um, it Marvel. is it is a very fascinating read. I want you both to read it and then you tell me what you think. We got to do a book report for you? Okay. Yes, exactly. We'll do so, a book review. I want to go back to some of your lessons you were learning. Uh, you talked about, you know, kind of connecting the dots from an end to end supply chain standpoint. You talked about mm -hmm. um, kind of the male dominated industry and, and how that kind of dawned on you early in your career. And then you also talked about adjusting to working for, for folks of all types, right? And, right? and how sometimes you've got to adjust how you, how you follow and probably how you lead, I imagine. Um, point when you, when you think of the global business and international business, and of course this, mm -hmm. this, this world we live in today, never going back to, to you know, when it wasn't global nope. business, right? Well, when did that, when did that um, one element of that dawn on you? What, what role really comes to mind when you really think of, of that global view and what really shaped that global view for someone that grew up in the Midwest? Um, you know, I think, um, so for me, it was, it was a, a few different things, you know, certainly um, getting into retail and starting to get into, you know, private label and imports and, you know, those kinds of things and really learning about, you know, we'll be more globally aware of things that happen and go on um, was, was, Part of it and then you know I um, and then having to in in my retail career you know going going on buying trips and experiencing more of the culture cult being you know more worldly from that perspective was definitely and and just you know adjusting and 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 I always think about when I you know got in my first elevator in Hong Kong and everybody gets in the elevator and you're like and 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 people warn me you know you're going to be very close that's that they're used to it and you're not and you know having and and really understanding i always i i tried to seek to understand cultural differences and 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 learn from it um and i think that that's really you know to me i find it fascinating like it's it, it's you know intriguing to me um how, how we're all different. And I think it's, you know, very, um, everybody brings a different point of view. And I think that, that trying to, to understand that, I mean, like, you know, when I, when I, you think back to being a Midwesterner, or I'm like, you know, I, I don't want everybody to be like a Midwesterner. I, I like having the variety. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, to me, that was a, 
that was a big point. And then, you know, and then running my own logistics company with my husband and, you know, really having to, to get, you know, a really understanding of, you know, like the, the, the amount of the different, different people that you meet and the, the different goals that they have. And I think, you know, the reason I say that about the warehousing, because I re, I'll just never forget the day, like some guy comes into my warehouse and, you know, and I was in California and I, we had a warehouse and he knocks on my door and he's like, can I, sh can I shift my load? Because his load was, was overweight and he need, in the middle and he needed to readjust the load. And I said, sure, you can come in. And my husband was like, you know, I called him later and he's like, what did you do? And I'm like, well, you yes. asked I'm like, you know, I, you know, and, and definitely had a, you know, he, you know, my husband was giving me a hard time, but, you know, he had, he was a, had a very thick um, Russian accent, obviously had, you know, like, like, this is what he's doing to make, make, you know, make it in America. And so that was, and, and then, you know, his little son comes out and sits there and watches him. And, you know, it was just, I think just all of those different experiences that, you, you know, you got to, you need to appreciate everybody's differences and you need to, you know, um, every, you know, everybody's, trying to do the best they can. So yes. I try to believe the yes. best in people, I guess, but. You know, as you shared that, Cindy, um, and especially as, you know, three entrepreneurs here and, and you're talking about your time running your own logistics company, I, I think that's when I have most, uh, that time in my life, at least, and it sounds like what you're sharing, that's when you really appreciate how everyone is trying to contribute. Everyone's trying to, and what's important to them, move that forward, you know, solve problems, take care of their customers, pay bills. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just a beautiful element of the entrepreneurial journey. So I, I appreciate right. you sharing that. Um, all right. So I want to, you know, when you talked about your 11 year old niece and what was her name? Her name is Jessica and she's 12 and she's almost going to be 13. So oh, I have sorry. to be forgiven for 11 because I'll be in trouble for that. Oh. But yeah, 12 year old Jessica. So hello to Jessica. Um, I want to ask you this next question, and I almost mm -hmm. want to ask you what advice you'd give Jessica, but I also I want to take advantage of the, the question I planned on asking you because it's a different time frame. And so let's, let's go with the first one first. So when you think back, if you had the opportunity uh, via Bill and Ted's magical telephone <laughs> booth to go back and tell yourself one piece of advice, say senior in high school, Cindy Lago, or senior in college, whatever you'd prefer, what would that one piece of advice be? Um, my, the one piece of advice is don't limit yourself. And it's the same piece of advice I give to my niece mm -hmm. because I feel I watch people and I, you know, I, even in, you know, when I, when I was in corporate America and I worked with individuals and they were in certain jobs and, you know, I, I really think that you know, no, am I capable of being a brain surgeon? No, but I'm not, you know, but that's not my interest either. But I also, you know, I don't put parameters around what I think I can be. And I think that, you know, we, we tend to, we tend to limit what we can do and what we can affect and um, impact in our lives ourselves. And, and so I, I think that there was a lot of times where, you know, I had to, I had to push myself and, and, you know, I thought, well, I'm never going to make it through this. And, and I'm just very, you know, I'm very grateful for where I'm at right now. And I'm very grateful um, that, that I can share those experiences with people. And, you know, and I can also then, you know, hopefully, you know, that when you, when I look back, that's what's important to me. It's like, don't, don't, don't limit yourself. Don't say that you can't run a third party logistics company because it's mostly a male dominated world. Don't say that, you know, you can't be involved in trying a new area and starting a new business or, you know, just don't limit yourself. Mm. Go for it. That's Love great that. advice. I mean, you know, one of the things you have to recognize as you're doing that is plenty of people are either going to intentionally or inadvertently place limits on you and you have to ignore that as well. Right. I mean, right. It, you, you are, you only have limits placed on you by other people, e even in the case that someone does influence that because you accept it. Right. right. So th that is, wow. That's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Worth the price of, two yeah. <laughs> of admission. Cause really if, you, if you're listening yeah. to this, uh, I would argue 
there, there's a small fraction of folks that really that that launch into their career and and don't limit themselves they've got all their confidence we've all probably worked with folks that never never challenge and then the plurality or the majority of folks do put constraints well if i can right. do that and they're not confident enough and so cindy what a be beautiful simple piece of advice that would be good for for uh senior cindy lago back in school or, uh, jessica, or jessica now or for that matter frankly any of us that are that are, right. that are working our good. way through the journey yeah, totally. And I think it's good that you're intentionally passing that on to Jessica. And I am, I imagine all of your other nieces and nephews as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that if, um, you, you get a lot of people always saying they can't do something. And I'm like, you know, well, the only person that's telling you you can't do something is yourself. So well, we'll have to bring uh, Jessica on one of these next shows and, and hear. <laughs> I'm sure right? she'll be thrilled with that. <laughs> so, yeah, all right. exactly. Well, so, <laughs> So you were, you were referencing a couple of times now and, and, and a few minutes ago, what you do now. And, and, and mm -hmm. some of our listeners that heard you uh, listen to the first episode that you were on may already know, but let's just refresh their, their, um, their memories of what you do now. Cause I, I find it mm -hmm. fascinating. I, I, I am uh, not envious because you're driving change in a, what's gotta be an incredibly challenging environment uh, and driving improvement. But, but so if you could remind us what you do and then, share with us a recent eureka moment you've had especially in the past you know 12 18 months so um so what i do now is i, I lead the supply chain practice um transfer and focus on transformation really for capgemini for north america so i've been here for um nine and a half years i'm vice president here and came in um in the supply chain practice and then moved um, up to to running across all all businesses um all industries which has been which has been really interesting for me because um to the eureka moment um learning more you know the funny thing is um with supply chain you know every, i always joke and you know it's not in your hands you're not touching it it did not go through a supply chain and so I always give, you know, my DCX fans, you know, they're like their digital commerce always like, oh, but it looks so cool on the website <laughs> and all of them. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't really mean anything if the customer's not holding, the, holding right. it in their hand. And that's any customer, right? I mean, you know, whether it's putting gas in your car, so that supply chain of oil and gas went through, you know, manufacturing a car, getting on a plane, you're not getting somewhere without going through some type of supply chain. So it's been, um, you know, to me, I think, the the biggest eureka moment is the most um the acknowledgement of the supply chain right through COVID. i'm like you couldn't have named your you couldn't have named your um your your company anything better right because it's, it's just it's all over it's all you did really well on marketing there um <laughs> it, it's it's really all around this the supply chain and 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 then you know i think so I've been managing um, a, a team, my team focuses across all industries. I think that, you know, to me, the biggest challenge has been and the biggest interesting Eureka moment is just besides the fact that it all goes through a supply chain and is is really around, you know, the, the changes that people are having to make in their supply chain. And, and I get fascinated with the, you know, um, working with clients on different ways of, of managing their supply chain, managing their, their, their product and their flow, and how do you get products moving, um, you know, to the right customers? How do you have that visibility? I mean, it also has been amazing to me the amount of people that don't know where their product is in their supply chain. Right. So I'm sure, I'm sure you guys have talked to a lot of, you know, companies and software providers that, that, you know, provide those, those types of services and that information, but, you know, really in today's day and age, I think that that is, you know, what's going on there and, and the analytics and, you know, um, how to drive transformation and how to use ML and AI in your supply chain and, and just the speed to which you get um, by doing that is just so impactful. And I think, you know, it's not easy. So I'm working with a client right now where we're doing ML and AI and, and how they do their and how they deliver the product to allocate the goods, how they assort the goods, how they pick the product, you know, how do I drive better decision making throughout my whole process? And it's it's not easy. And it's it's something that um, is not, you know, it's agile, right? It's iterative and it's agile. And 
and I think watching, um, working with companies today on, you know, what's available and, and I, and, you know, I think the, the importance is that in our, the workforce and supply chain, I, I think that, you know, I think that the executives get in and the leaderships are, you know, understand what needs to be put in place. And even the, the, the people that are executing it know what needs to be put in place. But I don't think they, you know, I think the change that you need to initiate in your organization to make it work is still a big area of um, where people need to work on it, right? So, I mean, how do you, I, go ahead. Well, this is your, your crystal ball is fine tuned as always, because this is where we're going next, Cindy. I appreciate I want to bring Greg back in because this is, this is the beautiful part and most rewarding, one of the most rewarding parts of our journey, because we, do, we are sitting down with these business, a wide variety of business leaders, as you referred to, right. and, and seeing what they're experiencing, figuring out what their unique and common problems are and how they're overcoming. So Greg, I know we want to pick her brain on, on some of these conversations she's having along those same lines, right? Yes. If you're, if you are working your crystal ball mm -hmm. um, or I like whatever the, device the it is you Greg. use or AI or ML or whatever device it is you use to predict the future, what are a couple of the things that, that you're seeing in, in today's environment? What are people leaning on, on you and, and your consulting organization or AI or ML or IOT or blockchain or whatever uh, technology or process or methodology or organizational changes? So, I mean, so, so we're definitely seeing people wanting to understand where the product is in the supply chain. And, you know, do you have, do you have the right control, do you have a control tower in place? Do you have the visibility and traceability in place? Do you know, you have, you see, you see that throughout um, what's going on because they, they, you know, it was very, you know, what you saw is everybody realized when COVID hit that they had no visibility, you know, or they had, there was a lot of companies that didn't have visibility. Where's my right. order? Where's my client's order? Um, where's my customer order? And so, you know, they, they needed to get that level of transparency and traceability out there. Um, now you see them dealing with that. So you see a big uptick in, in, in logistics, right? Whether it's WMS, TMS, um, that visibility layer, we see a lot around what's going on with that and bringing in analytics to help you, um, you know, optimize what's going on and, and reduce costs because the last mile obviously is shot up as well. And so, you know, people had mastered the last mile before this happened. And now they're just, they're just like, they're throwing everything out that they can just to get the product to the customer because they need that business. Yeah. So, you know, so there's, we, we do see a lot, you know, I see a lot of, um, you know, companies looking about, you know, the, the back end execution part of their system, you know, how do I get that? How do I deliver? How do I deliver to my customers on time? And then, and give it to them the way they want, where they want it, all that stuff. Um, you see that the, um, the other thing that, you know, is just how do I predict this? Like what is going to happen? I mean, you look at, you know, the demand shifts. If, if you, I mean, you know, you came from the industry of selling replenishment systems, right? You look at a two-year trend. Well, how do you work on a two-year trend and make a demand work for next year? You That's don't. right. Right. So, you know, so, you know, how do you bring in advanced analytics that you can help um, drive those decisions? And it's, you know, what's funny is it's not, it's not because people can't do it. And I think this is a big thing with, with, you know, and I've, I've worked with companies that do AI and ML and, you know, I think one of the biggest misnomers for, for customers are you have to teach it still. It's not going to be, it's not going to just, I mean, yes, you can put it on a system and it can learn behaviors and it can learn um, keystrokes and it can learn all the stuff that you want it to be automated. But if you want it to be smart, you have to teach it. And so, you know, I think that for, for what I see, um, you know, in the industry is that, you know, it's, it's, taking your brightest people and solving the business problem that needs to be solved and then automating that through AI and ML to let the system do it for you because you cannot move fast enough. You cannot, you can't go through the algorithms in your head fast enough. You can't, you physically cannot do it as fast as a machine and you can't do it as fast as your customer wants you to do it. So you have to bring in advanced analysis. That is a really, that is a really outstanding analysis. Because, you know, we hear a lot of people, and I'm sure you do too, Cindy, there's a ton of confusion around AI that you plug it in and somehow it works. You have to, yeah. you know, one of the analogies that I've used is don't think of it as the big giant head, 
for the anyone who's ever watched Third Rock from the Sun. Don't think of it as this all all knowing, all intelligent thing. Think of it right. as a child to whom you have to teach. You have Absolutely. to impart the knowledge of your most effective. I'm not even saying most intelligent. Your most effective participants in whatever process you want it to manage, because right. that's what it will learn. And man, that is such a great perspective. Um, you do have to teach it. You have to train it. You, you have to continually educate it. Now, at some point, it can start educating itself. But that foundation, that foundation is critical. Walk before you run kind of thing. I mean, you are parenting AI. So yeah. um, that's a fantastic. Okay. Yeah, and, 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 you know, it can be a really powerful um, tool. I mean, and, you know, the, the people, the thing that is, is that it's hard in supply chain. It's not easy. Right. I mean, in advertising and marketing, it's great. You just see, watch where people click and what they want to shop for. And then you just, you know, throw that up there every time they go onto a, um, to another site or into an app. But it's not that easy. It's not that, you know, in supply chain, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. There's a lot of choices. You can't give them ABC. You know, so it's definitely um, an area where we continue to, you know, work with our clients on like, how does, how do you inform that model? How do you drive it? But the, the bigger, the, but the biggest thing is, is that you have to, you absolutely have to become smarter in how you do things because you cannot keep up with it. The speed is, there's, there's no way to do it. So. And, that, and that's, I mean, that's the other key to AI is once you've imparted that knowledge, it never does the calculation wrong. It never forgets to do it. It never imparts emotion, right? Or, or bias in into that decision. And that's where the magic starts to happen is it's more repeatable. As you said, it's, it's faster. It's always complete. They never forget to input the, the, you know, the decimal point. Right. Right. Um, so once it's got that knowledge, it basically becomes a foolproof calculator, if you will, of all of those decisions that humans have made in the past. Right. And I think the good news is, is that you can spend your time trying to figure out root causes. I mean, people need to think about what are the advantages of it? The advantages of it are, it helps you step back and say, what's really going on, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's going to do all that maintenance stuff for you, right? It's going to even learn and become smarter. But you're going to, but you now can step back and say, okay, okay, well, I see this shift in my patterns of how people are buying. Why is that, right? Why, you know, or, or better yet, how do I want to direct my business, right? So, you know, for example, um, you know, it's been very interesting to me to see what's going on with Black Friday and how retailers are choosing to expedite Black Friday so they don't end up in, you know, so Black Friday and Christmas crunch does not kill them from a shipping perspective and transportation perspective. You see it happening every day and you see, and then they're thinking of new ways to do it. And they're doing that because they have, their basics are covered, right? You got yeah. machines in place to help you figure out like, be able to step back and see, look at the trends. Like, you know, um, there was a retailer that just came out with a, I'll give you $10 as a gift certificate to come in and pick up your own product mm. versus having me deliver it to you. I mean, you know, these are the things that they get to spend their time thinking about. How do I become more profitable? How do I become more sustainable? And, um, you know, and then that's the whole other big thing is, um, you know, using these tools to help you drive and find so that you can spend your time shifting your business to what's important. And that's really what you, what you use it for. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's where so much of the value is. Uh, and, 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 and looking ahead rather than working in the here and now. So, you know, Cindy, uh, as expected, I wish we could, we could dive deeper for the next five hours of what you're just talking about. Cause of course, technology is, is not just where supply chain is, it's where business is. And it's fascinating to hear some of these things right. that, that you're part of, but let's, I want to shift gears a bit as we move into this final segment here, because I'm really curious. We ha I haven't had this, this conversation with you on, on some of the previous appearances you've made. And I'm really curious. I know Greg and I are really curious about some of your perspective here. So let's talk about women in business. Mm -hmm. uh, you've already kind of shared a couple of, uh, of your Eureka moments and, and some of those experiences earlier in the interview. Um, you know, our great friend, Elba Pereira Gallagher with show me 50.org. I've learned so much from her experience and what she's sharing as she works in her nonprofit to really make sure our opportunities are there for everybody. 
And right. she showed me this one uh, graphic that is uh, a research and data driven. And it shows kind of the initial stage of women coming into industry and then the middle management stage. And then of course, where we all know the sea level where women are really underrepresented mm -hmm. um, there. What, when you think of uh, leadership trajectory and career progression trajectory and, and opportunities for women, what are some of your observations there? So I, so my observations are um, that, and personal, and even personally speaking, I feel like, you know, women um, aren't as bold as they need to be. And I think that sometimes the reason we're underrepresented is because we don't give ourselves enough credit. And um, you know, particularly, um, you know, being able to be to bring, you know. It, like, I don't know, I think we, a lot of times we were, you know, what you do is, you know, how well you do something should show people how good you are. And, you know, we need to be our own champions. And sometimes we're just not as bold as we should be. I think that, um, and, you know, we, we, so I think that that is definitely something that, you know, everybody should Nobody, it doesn't matter who you are, really. You should be bold and you should be, you know, you're your own best advocate, right? I mean, who else is going to do it for you? Um, so I think that that is, that's part of it. I think that, um, you know, it, it's definitely um, from a, from I think from what is, with the, with the working force changing and I think the way that we work changing, I think that, um, I think that it should be, personally, I think it should be good for women. So I think it'll be interesting to see um, how that evolves, but certainly being remote, um, you know, you, you tend to see leadership skills in women tend to be more communicated, more, you know, um, more of, of, of that um, leadership style where they, they want it, they, they have a conversation about it. And, um, you know, so I think that that's, that's helpful. I think that's helpful for industry to have leaders that are women that, because when you're not in the same room anymore with people, you can, you know, you, you can have women in leadership positions that, you know, actually understand that importance. And I think, you know, we talked about it, I think before the pre-segment, you know, it's about, you know, communication and, and, you know, how do you set expectations for people? And I think that, um, I think women leaders are very good at doing that. I just think that we're not as good at, at setting down our own expectations sometimes or being mm. as, as bold as we need to be. But I, but I do think that, you know, from a, you know, we want to make sure that things get done and we, you know, we want to and, and be driving forces as well. And I think this is an opportunity for, you know, women to really, and, and anybody to, you know, you, to my point earlier, you know, you, you, you're your own worst enemy sometimes. And so mm. I think, mm. It's just sometimes it's cultural, which is, is too bad. And sometimes it's just, you know, you need to break down of your shelves. So. Yep. There's, and, and as we all know, to any uh, huge system-wide challenge that we have, it's not one easy, simple thing. It's a, no. ma it's a vast collection of, of different things, to your point, both organizational and in, internal and intrinsic. Um, so, I think um, it's interesting, though, that, I, mean, I, I can't help but align what you just said, uh, being your own advocate <laughs> with your upbringing. I mean, if you think about farming in the Midwest, I can't tell you the number of times I've heard or heard a variation of a hard day's work is its own reward or a good day's work is its own reward. And I think a lot of people come to the workforce and I think so many um, women probably come to the workforce with that perspective. And when you're, and I recall being that way myself in the workforce, it's like, how come people don't notice all this good stuff that I'm doing? Right. Right. Um, but men have literally been in the workforce or at least these kind of workforce environments for millennia mm -hmm. longer than women. If you think about right. wars and armies and things like that ages ago where you had to, self-promote sometimes shamelessly self-promote to to right. advance not just within the military but a lot of those people had aspirations of of running countries and regions and whatever right so um there's a there's a 
sense of experience. I can tell you that it's a lot less of a problem for guys to be a shameless self promoter. Mm. At least that's been my experience in the workplace. Um, (laughs) I I would agree. I'm just, I was trying to be nice about it, but yes, I would agree with you. Well, it's okay for me to say it. Yeah, I (laughs) know, right? (laughs) You know, but but seriously, I, I think if you think about what you just said too, and you think about back to like, you know, the women went to work in the factories and they still accomplished something. So they made things every day. They finished making something. They knew how many they made that day and they went home and they felt accomplished. But as soon as that workforce for men came back in, they were said they were displaced. Right. But the, you know, we take accomplishing things, you know, to me is much more gratifying than necessarily just talking to a bunch of people. Right. And, and so that's a, it's a big, it's, it's something I think there, there certainly is, you know, learned behavior that happens yep. and we have to break that pattern and then learned behavior happens in all aspects of our lives. And we have to break that pattern. Hmm. So, all right. So we're going to ask you for more advice. Uh, just, oh, just a different iteration of, of the earlier questions. Uh, and so we know that you would share with, with women and with all folks, don't limit yourself. We know that that's one mm-hmm. thing you'd say. We also know that uh, what you just shared there, yeah. your own champion, right? Uh, right? So if you're speaking, if you're keynoting at the most prestigious university or the one around the corner <laughs> um, to graduates, you know, here in 2020, college graduates, regardless of what their industry that they're moving into, what would, you know, what would that uh, key advice item or two, what would it sound like? Well, so there's a, um, I have like these little eight ways of living, so I won't go through all of them, um, but it sums up to, the, so to, to sum up to what you just said, right? So there's, there's certain things that lead up to what, you know, don't limit yourself you know, you're your own advocate, but you know, there's these things that are subliminal, maybe Midwestern things, Greg, but you know, you got to do the right thing. You have to, you know, if you mess it up, you make it right. You, um, and, and there, there's a literary, like, you know, look at problems, you know, problems are opportunities and we're close. You know, there's like lots of little things like that of how you need to get through your base foundation. But at the end of the day, you got to be bold. And you got to be, so, you know, you got to be your own champion. You got to not set limits, but you got to be bold. And, you know, and if you do, if you're doing the right thing and you're bold, you'll be successful. Mm, love that. Learned. Bold and fearless. Just like Cindy Lago. I love that. All right. So Greg, out. I'm going to, uh, Cindy's going to get the last question, the trade dollar question, but I want to pose one quick one to you here as we're running out of time. You've known Cindy quite some time. I know that y'all have collaborated together. We're not going to go over the two decade rule. I'll, I'll, I'll honor that. <laughs> um, what's your, you know, Cindy well, beyond what she's shared over the last hour. What's, what's one thing you admire about her leadership style? Uh, so we've had Cindy and I have actually had this discussion. So one of the things that I will frequent frequently do and getting to know someone or understanding them is understand what their superpower is. Cindy is really, her superpower is in understanding and explaining things both straightforward and diplomatically. Um, Not overly diplomatically. I mean, she's going to call bullshit on you if you you (laughs) need to be called on you, but not unnecessarily either, right? Not unnecessarily undiplomatic. But look, I, I think that's, that's the thing with Cindy, what you see and what you hear is what you get and it's what you deserve. That's the most important thing. I think I, I've never heard Cindy say um, one thing where I've had, I have this saying, there is a difference between that needed to be said and you felt the need to say it. I have never heard Cindy say anything where she just felt the need to say it it always needed to be said. And you can see something, I mean, you can see, Cindy, as you were answering a few of those questions, you were being diplomatic, right? And, and I appreciate that. Still, you got your message across. Um, but I, I think that, to me, that's the thing that I most admire is, um, I'd put her toe to toe with any, any guy, certainly, or, and, and certainly with any leader. Um, and I think that's what makes her so effective is she just real. Love I just that. talked about you like you weren't here, but I had to. <laughs> I know. I, I'm like shocked. I'm like trying to get over it. Hey, if there's any year, any era where we need real 
uh, facts, direct leadership uh, with proof in the pudding. Uh, it's this a time we're getting through now, and and I can really appreciate that. I can uh, it validates a lot of my uh, early impressions in the last couple of shows you've been here with us, Cindy, and and you know in in the way you talk about what you're doing and and conversations you're having and the results that you are um, you and your team are uh, making happen. I mean, it make it 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 is Cindy Lago. So pleasure always to sit down with you here and share some of your journey and your your expect uh, your uh, experiences and insights with our listeners so i bet there's gonna be some clamoring for folks that want to compare notes and and follow up with you after the episode so what's the best way to get in touch with you cindy um the best way to get in touch with me is actually just going to linkedin and going to my linkedin pro- profile cindy lago because it's just easier it's c-y-n-d-i lago l-a-g-o um <laughs> Greg always gives me a hard time. There is a story behind that. When I was in fifth grade, no, I was in third grade, I decided my name is Cynthia and it's CYN. So my first name needs to be spaced, my nickname needs to be spelled CYNDI. So. I think it makes perfect sense. <laughs> I, I don't understand why more people don't do it that way. Me neither. <laughs> but you know what? We're going to make it even easier, Cindy. We're going to include that link to your LinkedIn oh, profile in the show notes. One click is what we're after here. Yeah, that's right. But uh, really have enjoyed having the back. We're going to look forward to taking a deeper dive, especially in all of your supply chain tech and business tech um, expertise and, and insights. That, that should be a whole series of its own there. So, uh, but thanks so much for your time, Cindy. Sure. Thank you, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Pleasure as always. Yeah. So have a great have, day. And, and stick around as we wrap up here, because we're going to talk about you maybe a little bit more like you're not yeah. in the room with us. But, uh, okay, we've been, good. Good to know. <laughs> we, We've been chatting with Cindy Lago, Vice President with Cap Gemini. Hopefully, you've enjoyed a, really a, a blend, Greg, a blend of, of not just her journey and the, her experiences and Eureka moments, but some very savvy commentary on what we're going through and what businesses, regardless of sector, are going through, right? Yeah, undoubtedly. I mean, look, what, what who can't learn from be your own champion and don't limit yourself? I mean, those are words to live by. It doesn't matter who who you are. And um, I think that, um, you know, the experience that that Cindy brings and the perspective that she brings from being a farm girl, we can say that because she says that. But I think that you can see where starting in a traditionally male environment made it sort of old hat for her. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't not doesn't intimidate her. You, Cindy, it doesn't int- <laughs> right. <laughs> Nothing intimidates her, right? And um, you know, it's inspiring. Doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether you're a leader. It doesn't matter whether you're a follower. It doesn't matter whether you're in supply chain. It doesn't matter whether you're in business. It doesn't matter whether you're in retail, which she also has re- has experience with, or whether you're in physical supply chain, I mean, that applies to you no matter where you are. And I just love the universality of it. Universality. That is the uh, 25 cent word that we're going to wrap up on, on today's episode, but it is true. Universal message. uh, And hopefully you've enjoyed as much as we have. We've been talking again with Cindy Lago with Cap Gemini Um, to our listeners. uh, Hey, if you enjoyed this conversation, check out a lot more, almost 500 additional (laughs) options to choose from. We're getting there. Supplychainnow.com. Please visit that. You can find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. Um, man, what a great show. Just like you heard here today. Hey, we're going to challenge you. It's like we're challenging ourselves. Do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.